And if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Recently, I had a friend Facebook me, and he essentially asked me this question. Based on the recent provocation we had with Iran where we took out one of their leaders, he asked me, does this provocation with Iran indicate that we are in the last days? And of course, my answer to him was yes and no. Yes, because we are living in the last days. The Bible says the last days is that time period between Christ's first and second coming. And so we are in the last days. We are getting closer to the return of Christ. But on the other hand, no, I don't see the event that happened with Iran as necessarily triggering the rapture and the tribulation. It's one of the pieces of the puzzle, no doubt about it. But that's what we're looking at this morning. John started this theme last week in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it's also the theme of 2 Timothy chapter 4, and that is how to walk in wisdom in the last days. That's the theme of chapters 3 and 4. Now, what Paul did in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, is he basically gave the characteristics of the last days. He said people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. He went on on giving that litany. Then beginning in verse 5, what he instructs Timothy to do is how to walk in wisdom in the last days. From verse 5 of chapter 3 all the way to chapter 4, verses 1 through 18, he's going to basically give us different ways by which you and I can walk in wisdom in these last days. And I think we know that our times are getting darker and darker, and so it's imperative that Christians walk in wisdom. And remember what John said last week, wisdom is being skilled at godly living. To the Greeks, wisdom was more theoretical. It was more philosophical. To the Jew, wisdom was being skilled at taking the Bible and applying it to everyday life. That's what it means to walk in wisdom. So let's look at last week what John covered, and then we'll pick up the lesson for this morning. First of all, if you and I are going to walk in wisdom in these last days, we must avoid ungodly associations. John talked about that last week, so we won't go into it. Secondly, we must also follow after godly influences. It's not enough just to avoid negative influences that'll pull me away from God. I must also pursue godly relationships. And then thirdly, by way of review, John said that we need to stay connected to God's Word. That famous passage in 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. He goes into what the Scripture benefits us. So we need to stay connected to God's Word. Now for this morning, let's look at the fourth way that you and I can walk in wisdom in these last days, and that is we must preach and teach the Word of God. I realize this one exclusively applies to pastors, but it's important that churches understand this because as the sheep, you got to hold the shepherds accountable. Notice what he says in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 4, in the presence of God, Timothy, and even Christ Jesus. And by the way, whenever you invoke God's presence, you're basically giving a solemn charge. He says, Timothy, you stand in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and notice what he says here, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this military charge. It's a command in the Greek. Here it is in verse 2, preach the word. Timothy, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And so Paul here tells Timothy, look, in the last days, you need to preach the word, Timothy. Notice he doesn't say preach your opinions. He doesn't say preach human wisdom. He doesn't say preach politics. He doesn't say preach pop psychology. He says, preach the word of God. And he says, do it when it's popular, when it's in season, and when it's not popular, it's out of season. See, that's the mandate of the shepherd. We are called to preach the wisdom of God found in the word of God. And unfortunately today, there's a lot of teachers that are not teaching the word of God. Basically, they're preaching pop psychology. In fact, one well-known pastor, I won't mention his name, they asked him, why don't you preach doctrine? And his answer was, well, I leave that to the theologians. My job is just to encourage the body of Christ. The problem there is he's making a false dichotomy. 
because pastors are called to preach doctrine. He says later, they will not put up with sound doctrine. And so that's what the mandate of the pastor is to do, is he's to preach the Word of God. I had a professor in seminary, and we asked him, what should we do in the pulpit? He said, preach the Word of God, let God speak, because you cannot improve on what God has said. And listen, we're not marketers. Typically in marketing, what they do is they find out what the consumer wants, and based on what the consumer wants, they develop a product in order to meet that need. Well, that's been the trend the last 20 years in the American church is pastors are trying to find out what the people want, and basically they develop a product to give them what they want. But listen, we're not marketers. We're not politicians. Politicians basically adjust their message to what they think is popular. He says to Timothy, in the last days, you need to preach the Word, and he gives him three motivations as to why he needs to preach the Word of God, Old and New Testament. Number one, teachers are accountable to God. Look what he says in verse one. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and here it is, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the Word. He says, Timothy, your mandate is done in the presence of God, and his kingdom is going to come soon. And by the way, when his kingdom does come, Timothy, you're going to be held accountable as to what you did with the Word of God. So the first motivation why preachers need to preach the Word of God is because teachers are going to be held more accountable. That's why James 3.1 says, not many of you should rush into the position of teaching because we will incur a stricter judgment. In fact, one well-known author said that on the day of judgment, when you're standing in line to get judged, and you notice in, you're in a line where the teachers are in that line, he says, get out of that line, and he says, go to another line, because that line's going to go a lot quicker. Because teachers are going to be given a more strict evaluation on whether or not they preached the unadulterated Word of God. Now, let me say this. No preacher is perfect. No one has perfect theology. But here's the issue. Are we misrepresenting God in the pulpit? Have you ever been misrepresented before by someone? You say to them, I didn't say that, you misrepresented me. We see that in the media all the time where people misrepresent one another. And you know, God has to say sometimes in the pulpits around the world, I never said that. I never said that. And so the first motivation to preach the word is teachers are accountable to God. Second motivation is the work of God's word. Look what God's word does. It's powerful. It is effective. Notice chapter four, verse two. He says, Timothy, when you preach the word, he says, reprove. That's what the word does. It reproves us. It convicts us. We've all been under conviction before. It rebukes us. It shows us what we're doing wrong. It also shows us how to get on the right path. But it also exhorts us. It encourages us. That's what exhortation means. It lifts us up. It builds us up. But notice he says, we need to preach it with great patience and instruction. Why? Because people don't always respond to the Word of God appropriately. People get mad when they get under conviction. Some people don't like it. And so pastors and teachers need to be patient as they instruct God's people. But I want you to notice the work of the Word. It reproves, it rebukes, it exhorts. And then if you look at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, John covered this last week, but let me remind you of it. He says to Timothy in verse 15, and that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, that would have been the Old Testament, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to what? Salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, God's word is so powerful, it is able to regenerate a soul. When you plant the seed of God's word into the soil of the human heart, it produces the fruit of salvation. So it is powerful enough to save a person, but also look at verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God, that is Old Testament and New Testament by way of extension. It is the exhalation of God. That's what inspiration means. And notice what the Word does. It is profitable for teaching or doctrine. It instructs us. Then it reproves us, shows us what we're doing wrong. Then it corrects us. It shows us how to get back on the right path, and then it trains us in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Here, the Word of God sanctifies us. In verse 15, it saves us. Now the Word of God has the power to sanctify us. I remember years ago, I was given a gift card. I think it was like $50 
to a car wash. Now, all of you have probably taken your car through a car wash. Now, this was given to me as a free gift. I didn't earn it. I, surely, I didn't deserve it, but my secretary gave it to me. And so I went to the car wash, and I gave them the ticket that I had gotten for free, and I entered into the car wash. You know, that's analogous to salvation. You and I are given the free gift of salvation. God gives it to us. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. But what happens when you enter into that car wash? You've been in it before. I remember as a kid, I used to love to sit in my parents' car and go through that car wash. As soon as you go in, all the suds begin to saturate the car, right? And then all those jets with that water begin to squirt. And then you got those little things that flap around like this, right, on your car. You know, it's just slapping everything around like this on the suds and doing this. And then what happens? You hit the blower. <sighs> I mean, that thing just cranks up and all the water begins to disperse. You know what going through the car wash is? Sanctification. See, entering is salvation, but when you go through the car wash, that's sanctification. God cleans us up. That's what he does. That is the power of the word. The word not only saves us, but the word sanctifies us. God sometimes uses his jet streams of water to cleanse us. God uses the blower he uses all kinds of things to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so, because the Word is powerful, because the Word has an effect in people's lives, he says, Timothy, I want you to preach it. A third reason why he needs to preach the Word of God, not only are teachers more accountable in the work of God's Word, but thirdly, the rise of false teachers. <clears throat> Notice what he says in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. People aren't going to want sound doctrine. That word, sound there, is an interesting word in the Greek. It's the word hygiene, healthy. People are not going to want healthy doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers <clears throat> in accordance with their own desires. And in verse 4, and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. He says, Timothy, I want you to preach the word because in the last days, false teachers are going to abound. And basically, what he says of false teachers is they're ear ticklers. They're cotton candy preachers. They basically tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And you see, it's fallen human nature. It's our tendency not to want to hear the truth because sometimes the truth can be very offensive. People today, even in the church, don't want to hear that they're sinners headed for hell and that they must repent and trust in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection in order to be saved. In some circles, that's very offensive. They don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way because it goes against the pluralism of our day. They don't want to hear that the Bible is the word of God and it excludes all other religions. They don't want to hear that you have to take up your cross and follow Jesus which may include suffering. They don't want to hear that abortion is murder, that homosexuality is a sin, and that gay marriage is wrong. And so what happens is there's going to be a rise of false teachers that are basically going to preach this cotton candy message. They're going to tell people what they want to hear. And you know what? People eat it up. Isn't that what God said in Jeremiah chapter 5? He says the false pre uh, prophets preach lies, and he says my people love it. You know, I have several grandsons, and my youngest, Jack, one day when Caitlin wasn't in the room, I wanted to give him a little sugar, because I wanted him to taste what the sugar was like. You ever done that? Now, if you do it with kids, you ever give them a lemon and watch their expression? It's a great expression. Their, their face kind of lights up. Well, with sugar, I don't know what I was eating, but I gave him a little bit of sugar. It may have been an ice cream cone or something. He went, his eyes kind of got wide. And I didn't give him any more. And you know what he did? He can't speak. He went, uh, 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 uh. He kept grunting. What was he saying? More. Give me more. You see, people develop an appetite for what you feed them. If pastors feed their congregation junk food, that's what they develop an appetite. Isn't that true in your life? Have you noticed the more sugar you eat, the more Debbie cakes, the more donuts, the more pie? What happens? You develop more of an appetite, and to try to get off that stuff, man, for the first two days, you're miserable. It's like, don't talk to me. I'm not in a good mood because I'm getting off of sugar. Well, it's the same thing. A lot of pastors are preaching cotton candy, 
and they're not given sound, healthy doctrine, and as a result, people are not growing in their Christian life. And here's the thing, you're always going to find people that are going to gather teachers to tell them what they want to hear. I like what Martin Vincent said. This is a great quote. You'll notice it up on the screen. He said this, if people desire a calf to worship, a ministerial calf maker is readily found. See, people will find what they are looking for. I remember my aunt was telling me years ago that Charles Stanley was doing the funeral of his uncle Jack, and it was in Miami, Florida, where I'm from. And she said the place was filled with a bunch of Jewish people who didn't know Jesus Christ. So funerals are a great opportunity to preach the gospel. Well, Charles Stanley eulogized his uncle, and I believe his uncle was a Christian, And Charles Stanley in his presentation basically said to the whole audience, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to go to hell. Well, my aunt said people went ballistic. She said you could hear a pin drop. People got up, they left, they were angry. But you know what? He spoke the truth in a spirit of love, and people didn't want to hear that. And so Paul here tells Timothy, I want you to preach the word, and there are three motivations. Number one, teachers are going to be held more accountable. Number two, preach it because of the work of the word, what it does, it saves and it sanctifies. And thirdly, we need to preach the word because in the last days, there's going to be a bevy of false teachers that come to the fore, and they're basically going to be teaching false doctrine, myths. They're going to be leading people astray. And by the way, that's why I'm thankful for Calvary Chapel, and there are a lot of other groups as well, not just our camp, that are preaching the Word of God, that are teaching the Bible systematically. Now, how should we preach the Word? Is there a model? Is there a pattern? Well, Paul does tell us what the pattern is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Notice what he says to Timothy. Timothy, until I come to Ephesus, I want you to give attention to three things the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Now, let me break that down for you. It's very simple. It's a model that pastors can follow. He says, read the text, Timothy. I want you to explain the text, and I want you to apply the text. Reading the text is what it means. Read it. And then he says, I want you to exhort them. That means you apply the text, and teaching refers to explaining it. So read the text, explain the text, and apply the text. That really is a model for us to follow. That's what we would call expositional or expository preaching. You let the text speak what it says. And so Paul here says to Timothy, if you and I are going to walk in wisdom in the last days, we need to preach the word. Well, there's a fifth thing that you and I must do if we're going to walk in wisdom in these last days, and that is we must be spiritually alert. He says in verse 5, Timothy, but you, In counter distinction to the false teachers who are not preaching sound doctrine, he says, Timothy, I want you to be sober in all things. Now, he's not telling Timothy here not to get drunk. That's the literal meaning of the word sober. Don't get intoxicated with anything. That is an application here, but that's not what he's saying. Here, he's using the word sober metaphorically. And what he's saying is, I want you to be alert spiritually. I don't want you to go to sleep spiritually. I want you to be level-headed, and I want you to be clear-minded so you know what's going on around you. Because here's what happens. Pastors and Christians can get caught up into trends. If we're not careful, we can drift in our walk with God. See, that's why it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, be of sober spirit. Same word here, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to what? devour. Do you understand that Satan wants to make you lunch meat if you're trying to walk with God? And one of the ways he does that is he lulls us into a spiritual lullaby. He puts us asleep spiritually. What happens is he keeps popping spiritual Benadryl like it's Pez. Remember those Pez dispensers you used to get in your stocking at Christmas? You know what he does? He gives you spiritual Benadryl. And so many Christians in the American church are asleep spiritually. You say, well, what is one of the signs that a Christian is asleep spiritually? Here is the sign. You're a Sunday Christian only. If you just come to church and that's the extent of your Christianity, you don't want to get involved. I realize some of you have health issues and you're limited and God understands that. But if you just want to come on Sunday and you just want to hear a sermonette for Christianettes and you want to just tip God in the offering plate and go home, listen, you're asleep spiritually spiritually. 
And some Christians don't even realize they're asleep spiritually. They're hoodwinked because they really don't want to be followers of Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be alert to what Satan is doing. Sometimes it's you don't get into the Word of God like you used to. You're not praying. You're not hungering for the things of God. You're not serving the Lord. Again, we're all going to be at different levels of maturity. I understand that. But we all should be actively pursuing spiritual growth. I remember years ago, I went to my friend's house in Miami. He lived in a gated community. And when you came up to the gate, you had to talk to the security guard and you had to give him the name of the person you were going to see. He would call them just to verify this was their security and their protection. Well, I pulled up to the gate and lo and behold, here's what I found with the security guard. (laughs) Now, somebody asked me, did you take that picture, Mike? Yeah, I did. Because listen, preachers are always looking for good sermon illustrations. And so, as soon as I saw him with his mouth open and the flies going in and out, I said, wow, this is a great picture. And I zeroed in on my cell phone, took the picture. But listen, this is spiritually where some Christians are. They're asleep spiritually. And don't assume if you're a faithful person on Sunday morning, you're necessarily not asleep spiritually. I mean, that's a start. If you're faithful in fellowship, that's a good thing. I don't want to denigrate that. But don't assume that if you're just coming to church, hey, I'm doing my duty, I'm doing my responsibility. The Bible says we need to drink spiritual caffeine. We need to take our spiritual no-dose. Remember spiritual no-dose when you were in college? It's that caffeine to help you stay awake. Listen, the Word of God is your spiritual caffeine. Prayer is your spiritual caffeine. Fellowship is your spiritual caffeine. Service is your spiritual caffeine. Don't be asleep spiritually. He says, Timothy, we're in the last days. We must be spiritually alert. Well, there's a sixth thing that you and I must do if we're going to walk in wisdom in the last days, and that is we must persevere under difficulty. Notice what he says in verse 5 of chapter 4. Very succinct. It's a command in the Greek. He says, endure hardship. He knew Timothy was going through pressure. Timothy was a type B personality. He wasn't aggressive. According to chapter 1, he was tempted to neglect his gift because of persecution. And so look what Paul says to him in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He says, Timothy, we're in a battle. You got to be willing to suffer hardship. And then notice in verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, therefore, Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but look what he says to Timothy, join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. See, he knew Timothy was going to face opposition. He was facing opposition. And Timothy, like us, didn't want to suffer. No one likes to suffer. Paul didn't like to suffer, but Paul wasn't willing to disengage from Christ in order to have comfort. In fact, he says this in chapter 4 to Timothy to warn him about the troubles he was going to deal with. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He says to Timothy in verse 15, be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. See, Timothy was facing pressure on the inside. He was facing pressure on the outside. And you know what happens when we get in the pressure cooker? Let me tell you what happens we tend to disengage. We can get very discouraged, and what happens is we stop going to fellowship, we're not reading the Word like we should, we get isolated, and what happens is in those times of difficulty, whether you brought it on yourself, or it's your marriage, or it's your family, it's a wayward child, it could be your health problems, or it may be persecution in your life because you're taking a stand for Christ. Whatever it is, trials will either make you or break you, They will either make you better or they will make you bitter. They will either draw you closer to God or pull you away from God. The choice is yours. And you know what? The two key things you have to do when you have to endure hardship, and listen, we're all going to suffer. Two things you got to do, very critical. Number one, abide in Christ. You've got to stay connected to the Word and in prayer because, listen, that's your lifeline. God speaks to you during those times of difficulty. He gives you a rhema word. God has your zip code, and he will speak to you specifically to encourage you, because you're going to have those times where you say, Lord, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm at the end of my rope. And you know, listen, when you're at the end of your rope, remember this, God has got you. 
God will strengthen you. God will not let you go. He delivers a word just at the right moment, but you got to abide in him. And furthermore, you got to abide in fellowship because our tendency is we want to isolate when we're going through difficulty. And he tells Timothy, endure hardship, Timothy. Sink your roots in God. Sink your roots in the local church. Be connected to God's people because they will strengthen you and they will help you spiritually when you're going through difficulty. One of my heroes is a man by the name of John Patton. John Patton was called to the South Pacific Islands. He grew up in poverty. He was one of a number of siblings. And one of the things he says in his biography is that his father was poor And basically, he would have devotions with all of the children every morning and every evening. Well, that impacted John Patton. And so, in Glasgow, Scotland, he worked at a rescue mission for about 10 years. He would go to the slums, and he would preach Christ, and people would throw things at him. He was threatened, and it was really preparation for what he was going to do. Someone told him in the South Pacific Islands, there's all these islanders that have never heard the name Jesus Christ, and he developed a burden for them. But people tried to warn him, John, don't go. They're cannibals on that island. In fact, 20 years earlier, two missionaries were eaten by cannibals. Well, he wasn't dissuaded. But you know what? Whenever you try to break new territory, he faced opposition. When he got to the island, he brought his wife. She gave birth to a child. Within a four-month period, he lost his wife and his child to disease. He says in the biography he had to bury both of them, and he said if it wasn't for the Lord giving him strength, he would have went out of his mind. Well, he stayed on the island alone, and as he was trying to preach, he was persecuted, disease, savages were coming after him. Finally, he ran out of food. He had to escape to a missionary compound to the other side of another island. When he got there, they basically burned the compound down, and he barely escaped on a ship. He left, came back to the U.S. toward Australia. He remarried, went back to the South Pacific again with his new wife, and there he planted churches, established schools, established orphanages, and he translated the Bible, and he had an effective 20- or 30-year ministry. But you know what? He had to endure hardship. Now, listen, we're all not called to that. I can tell you this. I'm not called to reach cannibals, thank the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, ministry is not always easy. Living the Christian life is not always easy. Taking up your cross is not always easy. But if you and I are going to survive these last days and walk in wisdom, we must endure hardship. Well, there's a seventh thing that you and I must do, and this one is obvious because you hear it here all the time. We must seek to rescue the lost. Notice what he says in chapter 4, verse 5. Timothy, I want you to do the work of what? An evangelist. Obviously, this was a formal ministry because Timothy was a pastor, and so he says, I want you to do the work of an evangelist. Now, most of us here are not evangelists. We don't have that gift, and that's fine. Not everyone has the gift of evangelism. Not everyone has the gift of mercy. Not everyone has the gift of faith. And so, if you don't have a certain gift, you're not going to do it with the same frequency and the same passion as someone who does have the gift. However, this doesn't obviate your responsibility and my responsibility if we don't have the gift, because the Bible says we're to be witnesses. Now, granted, you're not going to do it as often as someone with the gift. You may not prefer to knock on a door and say, hey, do you know Jesus? Maybe stranger evangelism doesn't appeal to you, and that's perfectly okay. But here's what you can do. If you're going to do the work of evangelist, You need to target one person and begin to pray for them. We talked about each one reach one. Do one act of kindness a month. You could do that every month. Take one of the ABC cards and buy somebody's coffee, buy somebody's Danish, whatever it is. I do it once a month. I did it two weeks ago. There, I bought a guy's water, and he was stunned. I didn't preach to him. I handed him that card. I said, hey, I'm a pastor at Calvary Chapel. I just want to bless you. Now, there are other people that I'll verbally declare the gospel. We went out yesterday door to door, and we shared with probably eight to ten people. Find out what works for you. But here's the issue. You've got to be intentional. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which is lost, and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So if we're following Jesus, that should be our priority. And you know what? If you don't like doing that, you tend to avoid it. And what happens is we just tend to neglect it. 
One guy in history that I read about recently was a man by Johnny Appleseed. That's not his real name, but he was given the nickname Johnny Appleseed because this particular man in the 1800s, he crisscrossed the Midwest of America, and you know what he did? He carried a bag of apple seeds, and he would plant them, and he would form all these apple orchards, and he would put fences around them, and then he would contract them out to farmers. The farmers would sell them, and I'm sure they got a cut, and he got a cut. And so he planted all these apple trees all over the U.S., in the Midwest. But one of the things that he carried was not only apple seeds, but he carried the seed of the gospel. And as he went planting these apple trees, you know what else he did? He planted the gospel into the lives of many children, and he shared Christ as he went along. And so today we talk about a church planter being a Johnny Appleseed type of planter. In other words, he just plants churches all over the place. You know what God wants you to be? He wants you to be a Johnny Appleseed. He's given you a bag of seeds, and here's the question, what are you doing with that bag? I remember when I worked for Mungo years ago. I remember we take that seed spreader. You ever seen that? You pour in a bag of seed or fertilizer, and then you push that thing, and you know what happens? It starts to spin, and all the seeds get broadcasted out everywhere. And I thought, what a great analogy for preaching the gospel. And so I want to challenge you. Every month, have one person you're praying for and say, I'm going to witness to three or four people this year, and I'm going to do one act of kindness, whatever your goal is. But listen, don't just sit there and say, well, I'm going to leave that to Pastor John and Pastor Mike to do. It is a responsibility of all of us. There's an eighth thing that you and I must do if we're going to be faithful and walk in wisdom in these last days, and that is this. We must be faithful to fulfill our assignment or calling. Look what he says in chapter 4, verse 5. Timothy, discharge all the duties of your ministry. It reminds me of Colossians chapter 4. When he ends the letter, you know what he says? Tell Archippus to take heed to the ministry. Now, this was a call given to Timothy. He had responsibilities, and he says, Timothy, don't be lazy. I want you to discharge all the duties of your ministry. So here's the principle. We're all called the ministry. If you've been saved, you've been recruited, according to Ephesians chapter 2. You're saved by faith, not by your works, but listen, once you're saved, God calls you to produce good works, according to Ephesians 2.10. So if you've been saved, you've been recruited. We all have ministries here. It's not just formal ministry. You all have an assignment that God has given you to do. You say, well, Mike, what's my assignment? Your assignment is based on how God's wired you and how God has gifted you and the station of life that he has placed you in. One guy that's interesting to read about is a man by the name of William Booth. You know him, Salvation Army. You know, at Christmas time when you're going into Walmart or one of these stores, you'll see, uh, you'll see the Salvation Army thing there. They're looking for donations. Well, William Booth in the 1800s began to reach out to drug addicts. He began to reach out to prostitutes. He began to reach out to drunkards. You know why? Because most churches didn't want those riffraff people in the church. Kind of like what Chuck Smith did with Calvary Chapel. He began to reach them and he began to preach the gospel to them. And you know what happened? A lot of them got converted. But here's what I love. When he was 80 years old, he began to lose his eyesight. His son told him, Dad, you got to slow down. You're losing your eyesight. Well, he went blind. Then he regained his sight again for a short period of time. Then he went blind again permanently. And his son said, Dad, I hate to break the news for you. You can't see anymore. You got to slow down. And here's what he said to his son. He said, son, God used me when I had my sight. Let's see what God's going to do with me now that I don't have my sight. And he continued to serve the Lord. You know what? That was his assignment. That's what God called him to do in his generation, in his time. God has an assignment for you just uniquely designed for you based on your gifts and your personality. In fact, it's based on your shape. I've said this before, it's worth repeating because we forget. Your shape is how God's wired you to serve him. S is your spiritual gifts. Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. You say, well, what is mine? What do you like to do? What are you good at? Then you have desires. What do you like? What is your passion? Then you have natural talents. By the way, spiritual gifts are given at your new birth. Talents are given at your physical birth. That's the difference. 
Then you have a unique personality. Some of you are introverts, some of you are extroverts, some of you are thinkers, some of you are feelers, some of you are both. Then you have your life experiences, whether good or bad. God takes all of these to uniquely form who you are. And you know what? Your assignment is based on your shape. It's not mystical. There are some people where God will give them a Damascus Road experience and say, do this. For most of us, we grow into our assignment. We look at what we desire to do. Listen, experiment. Try different ministries. They don't have to be on campus here. Even if it's praying for people, it's picking up the phone, calling people to encourage them. Listen, there is no excuse for Christians to sit, soak, and sour. No excuse. Now, I understand we have seasons where we need to heal, we need to receive. I understand that. God understands that. And there are times where our health gives us limitations. We can't do certain things. God understands that. But listen, there is no reason why everyone in this church that is a born-again believer should not be doing something with their faith. I don't know about you, but you know what motivates me? I want to fulfill my assignment because I'm going to be held accountable. I can't imagine... I can't imagine standing before God and he says, you wicked, lazy servant. And yet, probably half of the American church, that's what Jesus is going to say. You wicked, lazy servant. I gave you your gifts and you buried them. You did nothing with them. Don't let that be of you. If you want to walk in wisdom in the last days, fulfill the assignment that God has given you. We all have one. Well, there's a ninth thing as we wind down, and that is we must finish well if we're going to walk wisely. He says, one of the great passages in verses 6 through 8, he says, Timothy, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. A drink offering was a libation that they poured on the burnt offering in the Old Testament. So he sees himself as giving his life as he's about to die. Nero's going to cut his head off. He couldn't be crucified, by the way, because he was a Roman citizen. So he says, I'm like a libation. I'm like a drink offering. I'm about to die, and the time of my departure is near. And then as he looks back on his life, after he got saved, he says, I have fought the good fight. Timothy, I'm in a warfare. I fought the good fight. He says, I finished the race. I started the race, and I finished it. He says, I've kept the faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, I didn't deny God. Also, I kept sound doctrine. That's what he means here by I've kept the faith. And notice what his reward is. He says in verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know what? Paul is looking at his life and he's saying, not only did I start well, I finished well. And listen, a lot of Christians start well. They take off from the starting blocks. The gun is shot. And boom, they come out of the starting blocks, and they start off well. But you got to remember, the Christian life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And a lot of Christians don't finish well. Why? Because they're spiritually asleep. And he says, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have run the race. And he says, now Jesus is going to reward me. If you and I are going to walk in wisdom, we must finish well. I want to be able to look back on my life and not have a lot of regrets. We're all going to have regrets because we've all made boneheaded decisions. There's, all, there's things that all of us would change. But I want to be able to look back on my life and say, Lord, by the power of your spirit and your glory, I gave a maximum effort. Not perfect, but I gave a maximum effort. In fact, one particular person that finished well, you may have heard of him, he died this past week, was Jack Van Impey. Jack Van Impey was the prophecy pundit, if you ever watched his television or cable program, he would talk about prophecy. In fact, he was known as the Bible man because they said he had two-thirds of the Bible memorized. When he would talk about prophecy with his wife, Rexella, next to him, he would quote scripture after scripture. It would just roll off of his lips, and he never used the Bible. In fact, one person said this about his ministry. He led more than 8 million to faith in Christ over the duration, and I love this, listen to this, 68 years of ministry. I want you to think about that. 68 years. At the height of his popularity in the mid-90s, his show reached 25,000 cities weekly in more than 150 countries. You know what? Jack Van Impey started well, and he finished well. 
How about you? If you're going to finish well, you've got to be intentional. It does not happen haphazardly. You have to be intentional if you're going to finish well. Well, two more here as we wind down, and that is this. This is number 10 on our little list. If you and I are going to walk in wisdom in these last days, we must cultivate significant relationships. This is critical because this is what helps us to keep going. Paul here says, as he closes out the letter, he always closes out with greetings. That was common in that day. And a lot of these people that he's going to mention, many of them were ministry associates, but they were also friends. He says to Timothy, make every effort to come to me soon in verse 9. Why? For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Some think Demas pretended to be a Christian and he wasn't. Some think he was like Judas. We really don't know. We'll find out if Demas made it. But when the heat got too hot in the kitchen, Demas left. And he says, Timothy, come to me. I need your presence. I'm lonely. See, Paul had needs too. He says, Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke, verse 11, is with me. He says, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in my service. Remember Mark in Acts chapter 13 abandoned the missionary journey because it got too tough? Well, Mark seems to have matured here. He says in verse 12, but Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus. Now, who's Carpus? We don't know, but some think this is where he got arrested the second time and basically he was put in the prison he's now in, and so he left in haste, and he left his cloak. His cloak is what kept him warm. He says, bring that, and the books, especially the parchments. Notice in Paul's last days, what was he doing? He was reading, he was studying, and he was writing. He says in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He says, Timothy, be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. We're always going to have enemies in the Christian life. And then he says, greet Priscilla or Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesephorus. He mentions Onesephorus in chapter 1. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at my lettuce. Verse 21, Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens, Linus, and he could add there Charlie Brown as well, and Claudia and all the brethren. And then he says, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you. Now, what's the point here? We could take a whole message just on these names and what they did, but we don't have time. Paul was connected to significant relationships. We all have different relationships, family. We have friends. We have coworkers. One of the most important relationships you will have is with the body of Christ. And here's what's critical. If you and I are going to walk in wisdom in the last days, and listen carefully, if we're going to finish well, we got to be connected to God's people. Some of the people will be involved in service with us, and some of them are friendships. Now, here's what happens when you get in a bigger church. The bigger you grow, you lose the personal touch. It becomes more high-tech and less touch. In other words, you don't have significant relationships because I don't know anybody. That's why it is so critical that you get connected to a small group. Because let me tell you what happens. When you're hurting, when you're struggling, when you're in the hospital, when you're going through something, if you don't have relationships in the church, how are people going to minister to you? And here's what I have found as a pastor. People get upset. They get angry. Well, no one cares about me. No one ministered to me. No one helped me. But here's the problem. They're not connected to anybody. How else are we going to know? How else are we going to be able to minister unless you are connected in relationships? And listen, relationships are the glue that will help you run the race with endurance. You know why? Because in relationships, people hold you accountable, they rebuke you, they encourage you, and they lift you up in prayer. That's why they are needed. And listen, you are one relationship away from it changing your life forever. We all have relationships that impact us. I remember when I was in seminary, by God's providence, I came to chapel late. And when I opened the door, I was standing in the back looking for a seat, and there was a professor who got up and he gave a two-minute announcement about his class on leadership. His name was Dwight Smith. And I said, you know what? I got to go to his class. And I went to his class. That man, just like John has had several people in his life that has shaped his ministry, 
This particular gentleman was one of the guys that shaped my ministry. He has affected my view of the church more than anyone because he invested in me and a number of several guys. He was a gifted communicator, gifted leader. Little did I know, if I would have missed that chapel at right the moment, if I would have missed that announcement, I would have missed that relationship and probably never went to his class. You see how God providentially times things? I'm not saying every relationship is life impacting. I'm simply saying we have to be connected. That's how Paul was. Well, there's one final thing as we close out this morning. If we're going to walk in wisdom in these last days, we must rely on God's strength. He says in verse 16, this is kind of sad, and yet Paul is triumphant in the end. At my first defense. Now remember, in a Roman jurisprudence, they had two defenses. The first defense, and he probably stood before Nero. Nero was crazy. Burn Christians at the stake. At the first defense, what they would do is establish the crime that you committed. And then at the second defense, they would determine if you were guilty. And if you were guilty at the second defense, you would be handed down your sentence. So Paul here is in the first phase of his ultimate death. He says, at my first defense, no one supported me. That's kind of sad. But all deserted me. But notice Paul's heart. May it not be counted against them. Paul doesn't get bitter at the end. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't say, ah, these Christians, they're a bunch of jerks. I can't stand them. But notice his triumphant attitude in verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and what? Strengthened me. He realized that God was there for them. Listen, the Bible says when everyone else forsakes you, the Lord will not forsake you. The Lord gave him the strength that he needed. Why? Verse 17, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. That's a figurative way of saying that God rescued him. At the first offense, you know what Paul did? Instead of whining, he actually used it as an opportunity to preach to the Gentiles. He may have preached to Nero. The man had a triumphant spirit. I don't know about you, but if I was in this situation, would I have stood with Paul? Only God knows. You know what? Because if you stood with Paul, and listen, some commentators believe that Luke and Onesephorus, who he mentions in chapter 1, they were solid. Many commentators believe that if those two guys were there, they would have stood with Paul, but they may have been not in Rome at the time. Although he says, Luke is with me. Doesn't he say that? So it may have been that even Luke kind of backed away. Why? Guilt by association. But Paul here says, the Lord was with me and he gave me strength. And then he ends with verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and he'll bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Paul relied on the Lord's strength. In his deepest, darkest hour, when he needed people to support him, they abandoned him. You ever been abandoned before by someone? You ever been stabbed in the back? Don't let it embitter you. It's easy to get bitter. We have to say, Lord, you've forgiven me such a great debt. I must forgive. But you know what? In these last days, we need God's strength because I'm going to tell you what, it's not always easy. We have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to be Spirit-filled Christians because it's God's Spirit that enables us to run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So what have we learned this morning? If you want to walk in wisdom in these last days, and we're in the last days, here's what we've looked at. John last week and this week. Number one, avoid godly, ungodly associations. Are you hanging around anybody right now that's pulling you away from God? Are you dating somebody? Cut it off. Now, if you're married to a non-believer, don't say, hey, I'm going to get divorced. No. If they want to stay, the Bible says, stay married. Follow after godly influences. Who are you listening to? Who are you associating with that's pulling you up spiritually? Stay connected to God's Word. We must preach and teach the Word of God. We must be spiritually alert. We must persevere under difficulty. We must seek to rescue the lost. We must be faithful to fulfill our assignment or calling. We must finish well. We must cultivate significant relationships. And finally, we must rely on God's strength. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word to us and reminding us of what it means to walk in wisdom in these last days. And Lord, your word says that if we lack wisdom, James 1, we should ask it and you'll give it to us.
And so, Lord, help us to be wise people, Lord God, even in the midst of our failure. Help us, Lord God, to confess and repent. We know that you're merciful and that you forgive. And as you're sitting here this morning, as we close out, maybe God spoke to you. What is one or two things that God has spoken to you about this morning? Is it to get involved, to find a ministry? If you're spiritually asleep this morning, would you repent of that and ask God to forgive you? And would you begin to awaken yourself spiritually and not be a Sunday Christian only? Some of you, maybe you need to get involved in a small group. God has spoken to you. You're not connected. You're isolated. I want to encourage you. Hear the voice of the Spirit and step out and do what the Spirit asks you to do. Because if you don't, you'll never grow in your Christian life the way God intended you to. Father, we thank you this morning in Jesus' name.